Hello, everyone, and welcome to Indoor Biotechnology's holiday webinar event on the aptly titled CRISPR, Christmas CRISPR Cat, uh, where today we'll be presenting Indoor Biotechnology's CRISPR Cat project, uh, in which we are researching the gene editing of the major cat allergen, FELD1. Uh, appreciate everyone taking time from their busy uh, year end schedules to join us today, and we're looking forward to uh, presenting this information to you. Got a great lineup of speakers for you today. We'll be starting with uh, Dr. Martin Chapman, President and CEO of Indoor Biotechnologies Incorporated, located in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, Martin is a fellow at the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, and formerly a professor of medicine and microbiology at the University of Virginia. Martin's gonna be going over the origins of the CRISPR-Cat project, including its history, uh, as well as the first isolation of the gene for FELD1. Following Martin, we'll have Dr. Nicole Brackett, postdoc scientist here at Indoor Biotechnologies Incorporated. Uh, Nicole uh, is spearheading the research efforts for the CRISPR, CRISPR CAT project, and she'll be providing updates on the development, milestones, and future goals of the project. She will also shamelessly be plugging her cat, Nacho, throughout her presentation. You'll see multiple pictures <laughs> of Nacho uh, as well. And she's also sporting a very appropriate Christmas sweater here. I don't know if everyone can see that yet, but it's, it's got a nice Christmas cat on the front. And I'm your moderator, Beatty Sturgill, uh, Business Development Manager here at Indoor Biotechnologies Incorporated. But with that, I'll turn it over to Martin. Oh, I'm sorry, no, one more thing. Um, just wanted to point out that um, for the Q&A of this presentation, you can have post questions at any time uh, during the webinar. Uh, just click on the Q&A button. Um, you can post questions anonymously. They're, they're all private. Um, and at the end of the webinar, we will um, move through as many questions as possible. And now with that, I'll turn it over to Martin. Hey, Betty, thanks very much. Uh, welcome, everybody, um, on behalf of Indoor Biotechnologies. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you all, um, especially at the end of the year. Um, I want to just sort of, um, sort of the con concept for this really is based on a, an English tradition or a British tradition of uh, Christmas lectures, uh, which have actually been um, going on in the UK at the Royal Institution since 1825, when they were introduced by Michael Faraday. And what he wanted to do was to educate more people about science. Um, and since then, there's been a lot of uh, very famous uh, people who've given these talks at the Royal Institution, Nobel laureates, people such as Sir David Attenborough and others. Um, our, uh, this is our small attempt to kind of emulate the style of these talks, which is really a relaxing, um, easygoing presentation um, about a particular topic. And in, the, in our case, it's about cat allergen. Um, so I, I invite you to relax uh, and um, uh, enjoy the presentation. So um, my, uh, I'm not going to present any slides. I'm just going to give you some background to the project and how we got to where we are at present. So um, cat is kind of almost like one of the three major allergens in the U.S. in the sense that there's ragweed, there's alternaria, and there's cat. And a lot of work on these allergens has been done in the U.S. Um, the work started in the 1970s with Jack Oman and Kurt Block. Um, they published a series of uh, papers called Allergens of Mammalian Origin. And their, ide their idea was to, that what they were trying to do was isolate cat allergen. So that was um, 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 very important. They, they worked at that time on cat pelt extracts. Um, isolated the allergen by electrophoretic techniques and deemed the allergen to be called CAT1. Um, they also looked at the potency of extracts that were that contain this allergen. They had they detected it by radiolumine diffusion, which was uh, later adopted by the FDA for standardization purposes. And they uh, they said stated that the allergen uh, potency. Um, was related to the CAT1, or as we now know, FELD1 content, um, more so than CAT2, which was actually albumin. So this, these were important early studies. Um, 
in the 1970s and 1980s, um, people followed up. It was clear that the majority of catallurgic individuals were reacting with Cat1, uh, or as it was then known, uh, became known as Feldy1. Um, Henning Lowenstein and Ben Vecker um, did some studies where they looked at immunoabsorption and showed that 60 to 90 percent of the um, uh, allergenic uh, potency of cat extracts could be attributable to FELD1 um, and IgE antibody responses to, to the allergen. And then in the uh, um, uh, early 1990s, uh, Tom Platz Mills and, and Larry Gelber did their classic studies on emergency room admissions uh, in, uh, in one study in Wilmington, Delaware, showing that a majority of, of uh, patients coming into the ER with asthma in the suburbs, at least, um, uh, were cat allergic, and that was driving um, that response. And in fact, there's been a recent paper uh, from the NHAIN study, um, which has actually um, show, uh, estimated estimated that there are now about 350,000 emergency room admissions a year attributable to CAT. Well, um, in, in the question was immediately was, what is the source of, of, of the CAT allergen and how does it become in the, in, in the environment and how does it become airborne? So Bob Wood uh, um, did some classic studies at the time where he showed that um, the allergen present in homes, um, if you got rid of the cat, it took six to nine months for that allergen to get down to what we would regard as low allergen levels. At the same time, Tom Van Meter, who's also at Johns Hopkins, developed what really is probably the first ever environmental exposure chamber um, for allergen exposure. And this was the, the, um, uh, uh, known at the time as the cat room. And the cat room was about eight foot to be eight foot by 10 foot room in Hopkins. It had two cats in it. And, and um, you could generate airborne allergen and do real challenge studies by admitting patients to that room for most of them actually couldn't tolerate being in the room for much longer than 15 minutes because they suspended the allergen by blowing in it, but by using a, a, a shop back vacuum cleaner. Um, and it was a very powerful challenge. The aerodynamic properties of CAT were further studied by Frederic de Blay and, and Adam Kushtevik, who showed that um, the allergen stayed airborne for several hours. Um, and the reason for that was that it was present on small particles, uh, generally around two to 10 microns, which tend to stay airborne for long periods. So we began to get this understanding of um, what, ca what CAT allergen was, how it stayed in the air, the fact also that it was present ubiquitously in the environment. Um, Adan Kustovic did a lot of studies in public places in the UK and could detect it in cinemas, in pubs and so on, on buses, um, all over the place. Um, there were also some very good studies from Sweden um, showing that um, children in schools um, could be exposed to cat allergen that was passively transferred on, on, on other children's sweaters and so on. And that could actually give rise to symptoms. So a lot of information about the aerobiological importance and the clinical importance of, of cat allergen. But the question then was, well, what is it? Um, and we had to really wait until the studies, the classic studies by Jay Morgenstern and Immulogic um, in the early 1990s. Immulogic was one of the first um, allergen biotech companies. Their goal was to sequence the major allergens and to identify T cell epitopes on those allergens and then to develop better vaccines. So they started out cloning, cloning, cloning. Feldy one was cloned. It was shown to be two chains um, of, of uh, uh, and um, uh, so that was good. It was also shown to be homologous to a group of proteins called uteroglobins, which were thought to have anti-inflammatory properties. Um, at around the same time, and relevant to our discussions today, um, Rob Albers um, uh, collected samples, not personally from the Amsterdam Zoo, from big cats. And we were able to show, we had an assay for Feld E1 at the time, we were able to show that the, the allergen was also present um, in big cats, lions, tigers, pumas, and so on, which indicated that the allergen was, was widely um, produced by, by bigger, bigger cats. Around the 2000s, um, um, Tom Platz, Mills and colleagues showed in fact that we knew that 
patients were making a lot of T-cell responses to FALD1. Uh, that's why Immulogic was trying to develop that and did clinical trials of their T-cell-based vaccines. Um, but um, Tom Platz-Mills and colleagues showed that um, this particular response to FALD1 is something that we call a modified TH2 response. And that is if you're exposed to high levels of cat allergen, um, you actually, um, the, um, the, the IgE response um, to uh, FALD1 is suppressed. People become more tolerant to the allergen. And this is associated with an increase in IgG4 antibody responses. Uh, and that is the modified TH2 response. Um, so uh, again, confirming the, the, the importance of FALD1 as an immunodominant allergen for CAT. In the 2000s, um, Lisa Lotte Kaiser and colleagues determined the structure of FALD1. So we were moving forward to knowing what this all allergen actually is, what it's about. They showed that it was a heterodimeric protein comprised mainly of alpha helices. And one feature of the molecule was that it had two fairly large um, amphithetic ca cavities in each of the dimers. Um, around 350 to 700 mic uh, angstroms, square angstroms. Um, um, and the, the function of these cavities was really not known. They were thought to bind ligands, but because the protein was produced as a recombinant, um, the, these um, cavities were, were, were obviously empty. We have actually been trying now for over 10 years to get the structure of the natural allergen um, with Max Krutz at the University of South Carolina, and it has been singularly resistant to crystallization. Um, it is one of the most intransigent allergens that we've actually worked with. We are still plugging away at it. We're still trying various different tricks to see if we can get the structure of the natural allergen. And the idea there is that can we get the structure can we identify what is in these internal cavities and does that give us an idea about the function? So um, that's our goal. Um, it may be a Sisyphean task, but we are sticking at it. So, uh, that. so the excitement really for us was that when CRISPR came along um, around 2012, um, it provided an avenue where we could then say, well, look, um, if we can um, uh, gene edit FALD1, will that give us some clues into the biological function of the allergen? And also it raised the possibility of, of, of um, developing hypoallergenic cats, which were FALD1 free. So those were the real uh, the objectives uh, um, that we, we had in mind. Um, one of our student interns, she, she original student interns, did a, a, a summer project looking at the looking at um, other potential means of gene editing, which were, were were less efficient than CRISPR. We identified CRISPR as the way to go, um, and then uh, Nicole joined us about three years ago, just over three years ago now, and has been doing tremendous work on this project. So it's a great pleasure, really, for me to introduce Nicole to talk about this work um, and to to, to um, 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 present her data. So over to you, Nicole. Great, thanks, Martin. Uh, let me share the slides. Okay. So thank you, Martin and Beatty for the introduction and thank you everybody for joining for the webinar. Um, I'm excited to share this data with you all. So Martin went through the background of FALD1, so uh, I won't talk too much, uh, I won't add much additional to it. Um, just to emphasize the fact that at least 15% of the population is affected by cat allergy. And as Martin said, FALD1 is the immunodominant allergen. Um, current treatment options are generally limited to either cat allergen immunotherapy or medications that reduce allergic symptoms. So those would be antihistamines or corticosteroids. Um, the structure of FALD1 that Martin described so is shown here on the slide. Um, so as he mentioned, it's a tetrameric protein comprised of two heterodimers, um, and each of those heterodimers consists of two chains, so chain one and chain two. Uh, those chains are encoded by two genes, chain one and chain two, that are located in the genome. They're 
in a span of about 10,000 base pairs or so. Um, so as Martin also mentioned, uh, FELD1 is a secretoglobin and it's expressed in certain tissue types by the cat. So in the salivary glands, the sebaceous glands of the skin, the lacrimal glands or tear glands and anal glands. And Martin also alluded to this, but we know that cats produce an abundance of FELD1, but we don't know what the precise biologic function of the allergen is. So studies of homologous proteins suggest uh, that the allergen could be involved in epithelium defense, immune regulation, or chemical communication. Uh, several groups have looked at the sequence homology as well as similar binding properties between FELD1 and mouse androgen binding protein. So that's a protein that is secreted in mouse saliva and it's involved in mate selection and chemical communication among mice. Um, alternatively, a, a recent study from 2020 um, by a different group noted sequence homology and structural similarity between FELD1 and a uh, defensive toxin that's secreted by the brachial glands in the slow loris primate. Um, so although we don't know what the biologic function is, the, the next real question is, is FELD1 essential to cats? Um, so that really hasn't been determined, but Previous studies of the allergen um, tend to lead us to believe that it may not be essential for cats. So for example, uh, studies have shown that natural levels of FELD1 tend to vary significantly between cats, so up to a hundred folds. Um, and the levels of FELD1 even vary within the same cat. Um, also, to our knowledge, there have been no studies showing that low levels of FELD1 are linked to any known diseases in cats. So I mentioned that the main approaches for treating cat allergy are either immunotherapy or um, you know, over-the-counter medications, but there have been a couple novel approaches developed recently to target cat allergen. Uh, so the researchers at Purina have developed their, uh, the ProPlan Live Clear food product. Um, so in this product, they're introducing polyclonal egg IgY anti-FELD1 antibodies into cat food in order to reduce the cat salivary FELD1 levels. Um, in the studies that they've published, they've shown that the treated cats showed about a 30% reduction in salivary FELD1 levels um, and about a 47% reduction in the level of FELD1 deposited on the cat's hair coat compared to baseline. Uh, alternatively, a group out of Switzerland is immunizing cats in order to induce the production of anti-FELD1 antibodies. So in their studies, they've shown so far that the treated cats had about a 50% reduction in FELD1 levels that were measured in um, cat tear extracts. So there's a proposed threshold at which nearly all cat allergic patients um, show symptoms um, to cat allergy, and that's uh, purported to be around eight micrograms of FELD1 per gram of house dust. So a 50% reduction in FELD1 expression may not significantly alleviate patient symptoms, uh, considering that FELD1 levels can accumulate in houses uh, at levels that range from 10 to upwards of 100 micrograms of FELD1 per gram of dust. So then our proposed solution is to use CRISPR gene editing to effectively delete the major allergen um, from cats. Uh, so this is based on an innovation of applying the new pioneering CRISPR technology to the field of allergy research, um, as well as applying it to a well-defined molecular target, FELD1, uh, which is the primary driver of cat allergic disease. So Martin also mentioned that the FELD1 cats um, may have significant public health benefits, but there's also the great potential to learn key insights into the biologic function of FELD1 by effectively deleting the allergen. So I'll just go through briefly um, what CRISPR gene editing is. So CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. Um, so 
CRISPR was first identified in bacteria, and in 2012, it was determined that uh, CRISPR systems effectively act as means of adaptive immunity in bacteria. Uh, so in the event that a bacteria encounters a virus, part of the viral DNA is then integrated into the bacterial genome in a CRISPR sequence. Um, and the benefit of this is that if that bacteria then in the future encounters that same virus, the CRISPR sequence allows the bacteria to both recognize and then cleave that viral DNA. So there are two main components um, that make up a CRISPR system. So first is a short modifiable CRISPR guide sequence. Um, and in the case of CRISPR-Cas9, which is the most uh, well-known CRISPR system, uh, this is a 20 nucleotide guide RNA sequence. And that guide directs the Cas9 nuclease to a complementary DNA target sequence. The other primary component then is the CRISPR, so the Cas nuclease, um, so Cas9 in this case, uh, and that results in a DNA double-stranded break within the target sequence. Um, and that break is uh, achieved with high specificity and efficiency. So our overall project goal then is to use this CRISPR technology in order to delete FLD1, uh, the, both the FLD1 genes, so chain one and chain two, from cat cells and tissues with the ultimate overarching goal of generating FLD1 free cats. So with that goal in mind, I'll go through our experimental approach, which I've broken down into three um, different steps. So I'll talk about these in more detail, um, but those steps are target sequence selection, um, the design and delivery of the CRISPR guides and reagents, and then validation of the CRISPR knockouts. So for the target sequence selection, the main goal here um, was we would like to target conserved regions of the FLD1 genes. So our hope is to develop a CRISPR system that could be delivered to cats um, to knock out FLD1 chains one and two. Since we want to apply it to many different cats, we would ideally like to target regions of the chain one and chain two genes that are conserved among many, if not all cats. Um, so in order to achieve this, we first needed to sequence a lot of cats to, to identify where those conserved regions might be. So we received uh, discarded tissue samples from the spay and neuter procedures of 50 domestic cats. Um, those were generously provided by our local SPCA. From those tissue samples, we extracted the genomic DNA. We then amplified uh, our PCR amplified FLD1 chains one and two, Sanger sequenced both of the chains and then aligned those sequences from the 50 cats. So the sequences then that are shown here in the upper right hand side, those are the reference sequences from NCBI for FLD1 chains one and two. So the protein reference sequences. Um, the amino acid residues that are highlighted in the sequences by color and size, those indicate the residues uh, where we observed substitutions in our 50 cats. Um, so these are areas that differed from the references uh, in NCBI. The colors um, indicate uh, groups of, of amino acid substitutions that appeared to or were observed to occur um, in the same cat. And then the size of the residue corresponds, uh, there's a scale bar, bar over here, corresponds to the percentage of cats uh, that had substitutions at those residues. So for example, some parts of the chain two sequence, there were amino acid residues where nearly 100% of our 50 cats had substitutions compared to the reference sequence. Uh, so from this analysis, we identified at least 30 unique amino acid substitutions, uh, which were seen at frequencies of 2 to 98% of our cats. And at least 18 of those substitutions were novel. Um, we then mapped those substitutions on to the structure of FLD1. And it was interesting to see that a lot of the substitutions were concentrated at the interface of the FLD1 dimers. 
And then lastly, and most importantly for the CRISPR work, we also identified multiple conserved regions in both chains one and two, which are suitable for CRISPR editing. Um, and in this case, in the sequences, these are denoted as the regions that are underlined in the sequences. So once we had our conserved regions identified, uh, the next step was to synthesize our CRISPR guides. So we did this uh, through Thermo Fisher. Um, first, we designed our guides using a nice online bioinformatics platform that's called CRISPR. Um, we ended up designing six different uh, guides targeted to FELD1 chain one. So these are labeled C1G1 through C1G6. And we designed four guides targeted to FELD1 chain two. These are labeled C2G1 through C2G4. We also had some negative and positive control guides. These were synthesized through Fisher. Uh, we then delivered each of our CRISPR guides as well as Cas9 nuclease uh, to immortalize feline kidney epithelial cells. So this is a CRFK cell line. Um, and our CRISPR reagents were delivered to the cells using lipid-based transfection. So the cells were incubated with the CRISPR reagents for 48 hours. And at the end of that incubation period, the cells were harvested to evaluate the uh, CRISPR editing efficiency. So at the end of that 48 hours, we, we used two different methods to evaluate the CRISPR editing efficiency of each of those feld one specific guides. Um, so these two methods, you'll hear me refer to these throughout the talk. Um, so it's a sequence-based method uh, and an enzyme or gel-based method. So I'll go through the sequence decomposition method first. Um, so after we harvested the cells, we PCR amplified around chain one and chain two, so where we expect to see our CRISPR edits, and sequenced um, those samples, so our control samples and our hopefully CRISPR edited samples. We then turned to several online bioinformatics platforms. So in this case, we used TIDE, which is tracking of indels by decomposition, and ICE, which is inference of CRISPR edits. In those platforms, we uploaded our DNA trace sample for our control. Um, and from that control DNA trace, those platforms identified all of the potential insertions or deletions that could result from uh, a CRISPR cut at our, uh, based on our guide sequence. Um, so that means it identifies, uh, you know, potential plus one insertion, minus one deletion, et cetera. Um, the platform then uses regression analysis to determine the relative abundance of each of those insertions or deletions uh, that are detected in the edited sample. From that uh, information, then the CRISPR editing efficiency of that specific CRISPR guide is determined. So then the other method um, is the enzymatic detection of base pair mismatches. Uh, so again, at the end of our uh, CRISPR experiment, we uh, PCR amplified around our expected CRISPR cut sites. We then denatured and allowed uh, those single strands to randomly re -annealed. So we separated the double-stranded DNA, allowed the strands to randomly re which meant you know, control strands might re with CRISPR edited strands, or an edited strand with a plus one insertion might re with a minus one deletion strand. And then we added a nuclease that recognizes single base pair mismatches to our DNA mix. So in this case, that nuclease was T7 endonuclease 1. And that recognized single base pair mismatches and cleaves at those sites. Um, so at the end of this, we take all of that DNA and run it on a DNA gel where we can actually visualize the CRISPR editing. So I've tried to demonstrate that here on the right hand side, where what we would expect to see with CRISPR editing is we would have a parent band, which is equivalent to the size of the full length uh, DNA double stranded fragment that we started with. And we would have two fragment bands equivalent in size to either side of the CRISPR edit. Uh, we could then estimate CRISPR editing efficiency based on the 
band intensity of uh, detected on the gel. So we applied both of these methods then to look at all 10 of our CRISPR guides. So again, we had six guides targeted to chain one, four to targeted to chain two. And our results are shown here in the bar graph on the lower left-hand side. So we found overall editing efficiencies that ranged from about five to 55% for those 10 guides. Uh, we also identified from this analysis at least two highly efficient guides. So uh, guide C1, G1, highlighted here with an arrow, um, which was targeted to chain one, and guide C2, G1, targeted to chain two. Um, an interesting observation that we had, which I've, I've highlighted here for guide C2G1, which is circled, um, is the gel-based or the enzyme-based um, method actually underestimated the, the uh, editing efficiency of the, of the guide. And that was a result of a low distribution of insertions or deletions as a result of that guide. Um, so what that means, which was interesting to visualize, um, so looking at this pie graph on the lower right-hand side, this is for guide C2G1, the right-hand side of the pie chart shows zero insertions or deletions, so no CRISPR editing for about 45% of the DNA population. Um, but most of the CRISPR editing, which is the rest of the 55% or so of this pie chart, at least 80% of those edits were due to a minus one base pair deletion, um, which meant that because there was really no single base pair difference um, between the chains, it meant that the enzyme couldn't detect a difference. So the overall takeaway from this is that it was beneficial to do both methods um, for evaluating the efficiency of all of those guides. Uh, and then lastly, on the right-hand side, I've just shown a representative gel for guide C1G1, just to highlight what the gel looks like with the CRISPR editing efficiency, where you have your parent band, which is at about 600 base pairs, and then your two fragment bands, which should, again, total up to that parent band. Um, and in this case, the editing efficiency was about 50%. So there are multiple advantages um, of, of CRISPR compared to existing editing technologies. Um, for example, improved specificity, um, improved precision, um, you can do high throughput editing. But one of the major limitations or uh, primary concerns for CRISPR is the potential for off-target editing at unintended um, sequences or off-target sequences at unintended genomic sites. Um, so that happens when you have sufficient homology between your CRISPR guide sequence and other unintended sequences in the genome. Uh, thankfully, a lot of the guide design bioinformatics platforms will allow you to predict potential off-target sites. So for example, when we use CRISPR to develop our guide RNA sequences, uh, it also predicted potential off-target sites. And it does that by comparing your guide RNA sequence to the whole genome for your species of interest. Um, so in this case, we looked at the predicted potential off-target sites for our two top guides. So that was C1G1 and C2G1. Um, and we, we analyzed those potential off-targets using, using both of those um, validation methods. So the sequence method and the gel-based method. And thankfully we found no evidence of off-target editing due to our guides. Um, there are other off-target tools uh, that also allow for um, unbiased genome-wide analysis of, of double-strand breaks. Um, so thankfully, there are a lot of tools available now um, for, for off-target detection. So recently, we've expanded our sequence and structural analysis um, in order to identify and sequence Feldy-1 orthologs in exotic cat species, so big and wild cats. And we've done this as an approach to gain 
hopefully, uh, further insight into the evolution and potential function of the allergen. Uh, so we've done so far a preliminary analysis of at least eight exotic cat species, which are shown here on this timeline. Um, so these species range from cats that diverge from domestic cat relatively recently. So that includes Chinese mountain cat and black footed cat. Uh, all the way to cats, uh, big cats that diverged nearly 11 million years ago. Uh, so those include African lion and Bengal tiger. So 24 exotic cat genomes that were publicly available in NCBI's sequence read archive database uh, were searched by BLAST. So uh, we used the domestic cat reference sequences to BLAST these genomes. And then we identified FELD1 orthologous sequences. Those sequences for each of the exotic cats were then assembled, aligned, and analyzed using Genius Prime software. And we did a similar sequence analysis that we did with our domestic cats. So the sequences on the bottom half of the screen, again, are the reference sequences for FELD1 chains one and two in domestic cat. And then each of the highlighted amino acid residues um, reference where we saw substitutions in our exotic cats or where there were differences in our exotic cats compared to the domestic cat reference. So in this case, the color represents um, each of the exotic cat species that had substitutions at those particular residues. And again, the size of the uh, residue corresponds with the percentage of cats that had substitutions at that particular residue. Um, you'll see some black dots located underneath some of the residues and those highlight uh, where we also saw substitutions among our 50 domestic cats as well. Um, so from this analysis, we identified 55 unique amino acid substitutions in our exotic cats and those ranged in frequency from four to 100% uh, of those exotic cats. Um, overall, you can see we saw a lot more substitutions in our exotic cats than we saw in our domestic cats. Um, from this, we then did pairwise alignment of our exotic cat sequences, as well as our domestic cat sequences with the references for FELD1 chains one and two. And this is shown in the plot on the upper right hand side. Um, so interesting observations from this, uh, from the pairwise alignment. So we did notice that chain two is more variable than chain one, uh, which really agrees with what we see below in the sequences where you can see all, a lot more substitutions occurring in chain two. Um, but one of the really interesting observations that we saw is uh, with our pairwise alignments, looking at both the DNA and the protein, uh, we noticed that the DNA sequences, in fact, had higher identities than the corresponding protein sequences, um, which was surprising because in most cases for most genes, uh, particularly for genes that are conserved, it's the exact opposite, that you would expect to see the protein sequences with higher identities, which would um, be more indicative that you have a conserved gene. Um, so that, that was a surprising observation. So we mapped then all of our domestic cat and exotic cat substitutions back onto FELD1, um, onto the structure, the recombinant structure of FELD1. And the main takeaway here is that once again, we still saw that most of our uh, most of the substitutions were concentrated at that dimer interface. And uh, the other takeaway is that um, nearly all of the substitutions that we observed in the domestic cats were also observed in the exotic cats, um, in addition to many more substitutions observed in the exotic cats. So we had the pleasure of working with a software engineer named Mishan Jha from the Broad Institute. And he helped us, um, well, he did all of the work. We supplied him with the data. He put together a nice corresponding uh, interactive visualization, uh, which I'll try and demonstrate here. Hopefully this will work. So this is at feldy1viz.com. Um, and this is nice because it allows us to 
uh, play with the structure of FELD1. So here we have, again, the tetrameric structure of FELD1. Uh, we can visualize it in both ribbon structure or surface structure as well. Um, but he's put together a nice visualization to, to show all of our substitutions that we've noted so far in both our domestic and exotic cats. So we can toggle between our domestic or exotic cat substitutions that we observed. We can also select our individual substitutions um, and see where they fall on the structure, but we can also get nice information about that specific substitution. So what that substitution actually was, um, also the frequency of the substitution. For the exotic cats, it's nice because we can see specifically which exotic cat species actually um, encoded for that specific substitution. And then on the domestic cat side, um, we don't have species specific information, but we see uh, again, the frequency of cats that had that specific substitution. And then we also see which other substitutions appeared to uh, be encoded or correlate with that specific substitution as well. So our overall conclusions then from this preliminary work, um, the, the work that we did in the domestic cats was instrumental because it helped us identify conserved regions that are suitable for targeting with CRISPR editing. Um, then we had our in vitro knockouts uh, of FELD1 chains one and two. And again, we saw editing efficiencies of up to 55%. But the main takeaway from this is it was proof of principle that we can achieve CRISPR editing of FELD1 um, using CRISPR Cas9. Uh, next, our comparative analysis of uh, the FELD1 sequences in domestic cat, as well as the orthologous sequences from exotic cats, um, proved very interesting because it, it highlighted um, the low sequence identities that, that we found for both the FELD1 genes. And, and that suggested ultimately that the allergen um, may not be well conserved and that the protein may not be essential for cats. Um, uh, as a result. So then taken together, uh, our data overall indicate that FELD1 is both a rational and viable target for gene deletion, uh, which could significantly benefit cat allergy sufferers. So a couple of future steps. Uh, currently in progress, we're working on expanding the sequence and structural analysis. So we're adding even more cats. Um, we hope to have more than 150 domestic cats in our analysis and around or of more than 130 exotic cats. And again, this will um, allow us to further assess the evolution and potential function of the allergen. Um, the next step for the CRISPR work will be to um, test our FELD1 guide RNAs in primary feline cells. Um, so we're uh, imagining this will likely be in salivary gland cells, and this will be to confirm protein expression knockout. And then finally, although our comparative analysis, um, you know, suggests that the allergen may not be conserved or essential, the real test will be doing the knockout in cats. So effectively deleting FELD1 from cats will, will answer the question of whether it is essential and hopefully what the biologic function may be. Um, so, so eventually down the road, the goal is to use our FELD1 guides and apply apply those guides to in vivo studies. So this will include knockout studies in cat embryos uh, in order to assess the viability of feld one free cats, and then eventually applying the latest therapeutic uh, gene editing approaches, which uh, for the most part include viral vectors or lipid nanoparticles um, in order to achieve the targeted deletion of feld one in adult cats. So I'll end this um, by just stating that there have been several successful applications of CRISPR in allergy research beyond deleting FELD1 in cats. Um, so I wanted to highlight here some of the other applications that have been or in the process of being uh, applied. So CRISPR has been used um, or has been shown in studies for, to delete 
uh, the major allergens in hen's egg. CRISPR has also been applied to delete the beta-lactoglobulin milk allergen uh, in goats and cows. It's currently being used to delete RH2 and other major allergens in peanut. And then CRISPR is also being used to delete major allergen genes uh, in both wheat and soybean plants. So with that, I wanna thank and acknowledge everybody who has collaborated on this project. Um, everybody at Indoor Biotechnologies and particularly Ford Cleveland, who was instrumental with the bioinformatics analysis. And I also wanna thank Dr. Anna Pomez and of course, Dr. Martin Chapman. Um, Thank you to Mazar Adley at Northwestern University who helped us with the uh, CRISPR experimental design and Brian Davis at Texas A&M University who helped with the bioinformatics work. Uh, thank you to Gregor Larson who helped with some of the early uh, sequence analysis. Uh, we're also hoping to collaborate further with Gregor and add some ancient cat DNA to our analysis. And again, thank you to Nishant Jha from the Broad Institute for the wonderful um, interactive visualization to accompany our study. And with that, I will stop sharing and turn it back over to Baby. Great, thanks, Nicole. And thanks to Martin as well for those, those great presentations. Um, quick reminder, uh, as we head into the Q&A section, um, if you have any questions, please uh, click on the Q&A button in the toolbar and you can post them there. Um, Nicole, I think uh, when we discuss CRISPR-Cat, uh, one of the most predominant questions we get is, you know, given that the biologic function of FELD1 is unknown, uh, you know, deleting this protein may have del uh, deleterious effects. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so like you mentioned, that is probably the number one question or comment that we have received either at meetings or in publication reviews. Um, so that is one of the major concerns. Um, our response to that is that we're hopeful that the bioinformatics analysis that we have, you know, supports the notion that the genes are not essential for cats. So again, our analysis is showing that the FELD1 genes, chain one and chain two, are a lot more variable than we would have expected, and especially more variable than we would expect for a gene that is conserved or essential for the animal. Um, for example, uh, I think up to 70% or so of the substitutions that we're seeing in the chains one and two, um, those changes are dissimilar changes, um, meaning that uh, the amino acid substitutions will either change charge or pol pol uh, polarity, um, which would likely have a significant effect on uh, the structure of FLD1 and potentially the binding capacity of FLD1 as well. Um, so that analysis leads us to believe that the protein is not conserved and thus not essential for cats. Um, but again, the, like I said, the main way we will determine um, essential, whether or not the protein is essential and conserved will be to do the actual knockout. Um, and really our milestone to make sure that um, we're not harming cats, again, is to do the deletion at the embryo stage and confirm that um, it results in, in, in a viable embryo. Great, thank you. Uh, so you also mentioned that the uh, FELD1 editing efficiencies were five to 55%. Um, how does that compare to the other CRISPR applications? Are you aware? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so editing efficiency can vary widely. Um, and really, it, it depends on a lot of different factors. So it depends on your genomic target. So for example, FELD1 in and of itself is a somewhat difficult DNA target, just given different features in the DNA itself. Um, uh, there are a lot of repeats that make it a little bit more challenging. Um, so genomic target, um, the actual animal uh, or the, the species that you're targeting, uh, the CRISPR system that's being used for the targeting, so Cas9 versus some of the other CRISPR systems, all of these things um, will have an effect on your efficiency. Uh, but the literature has shown that 
under ideal conditions, you can achieve editing efficiencies up to or greater than 90 percent. Mm. Um, that is achievable. But from what I've seen with uh, similar in vitro applications of CRISPR-Cas9 that we are um, right in line with, with what we would expect because um, it looks like averages are around 40 to 50%. Um, another way I can answer that is uh, our editing at our positive control, um, for example, which was a different gene that we targeted. Uh, the maximum editing that we achieved in that case was around 65 to 70%. Uh, so if that is our threshold for the best we can do, uh, then the 55% was pretty good. So we were happy with that. Great, thank you. Um, so do you happen to know why some cats uh, like Siberians, for example, uh, have lower FELD1 than, than other cats? Uh, so it really varies from cat to cat. Um, there, there have been studies of Siberians suggesting that as a breed, Siberians on average have lower FELD1 levels. Um, but I don't know that that has officially been shown in practice that it's the case with every Siberian cat. So if you were to adopt a Siberian cat, there's no guarantee that you're going to have a low producing or a, a cat that expresses or produces low levels of Feldy one It really varies from cat to cat. And I don't think there has been any definitive evidence even that um, based on gender or age that you can really uh, guarantee that you're gonna get a low producer. Mm -hmm. if, if I could just chip in, um, baby. I, I mean, I think it may, may be an element of how, how the gene is transcribed in different cats in terms of what the mechanism might be. Um, also, you know, there could be other issues about about sort of the anatomical location and those kinds of things. I think this kind of research is something that's going to allow us to investigate those things, but obviously we haven't got there at the moment. Um, and as far as the worst case biological problems with cats, is it that's something that we tend to try to not to think about. <laughs> uh, but but um, um, it, it has come up and our, our approach really is... Um, you know, um, obviously because of the ubiquitousness of the allergen, there's a tendency to think that this is super important. But as Nicole had outlined, there is huge variation in Feldy one expression in different cats. And our, our, our approach really is to say, look, um, we can address this problem with CRISPR because if we can actually delete the gene, it's going to give us an answer one way or another. Um, and that I think is the ultimately is going to be the main area. Obviously, if we did le learn more about the biological function of the protein, then one might then be able to project uh, or predict in and or, or, or do some kind of modeling that might assess what 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 the uh, um, outcome of the deletion might be. But again, these are sort of futuristic types of of, of study um, that um, that we 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 need to um, we need to look at. Great. So in your comparative analysis, you found average identities of, 95, of approximately 95%, which seem relatively high. Uh, how do these identity values suggest a lack of gene conservation? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so 95% does seem relatively high, uh, you know, especially if you were considering comparing Feldy one uh, versus you know the mouse antigen binding protein. If you had 90, 95 percent identity, you would say that's very homologous, very similar. Um, we're really looking at it from an evolutionary perspective. So, from the evolutionary side, you would expect for a protein that is well conserved or essential, you would expect to see you know, upwards of 99 percent identity. Um, in our case, the 95-ish percent identity is in fact um, almost equivalent to the genome-wide average between cats. So if you compare the whole genome of uh, one cat species with another, the average identity is also close to about 95%, and that's including non-coding regions and introns, etc. Um, so that's why uh, that 95% identity for Feldy one suggests that, uh, you know, it's not conserved and, and not essential um, 
from the evolutionary perspective. So are the conserved regions the same in other species beyond the, the domestic cat? So the other cat species had a lot more substitutions, um, but the conserved regions looked to a appeared to be in roughly the same location mm -hmm. um, with the addition of a few more substitutions as well. Um, but in general, they were around the same regions. Okay. Uh, on the same topic of regions, uh, has any work been done involving um, identifying the IgE binding uh, epitomes? I think that work is in progress, but I don't <laughs> think there's really anything known yet at the moment. So that's where I think that'll be a critical piece of information. Once we know what those um, binding epitopes are, it'll be very interesting to see how they overlap with our sequences um, and if those are in fact conserved regions or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so Beatty, I think the other, um, uh, we are currently working with human IgE monoclonal antibodies to cell D1. Um, and we have, um, we're working with Scott Smith at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, who's, who's produced the antibodies and, and Dr. Anna Pomes has identified them here. So we're now in the process, we have several IgE monoclonal antibodies to cell D1. Um, we're working with Max Kruitz to do, to do, um, and Jeff Mueller at NIEHS to look at the, the, uh, the, the structure of these epitopes. Uh, and um, I would expect that that data, um, uh, uh, you know, will, will come out over the next year or so. Uh, we'll see. Obviously, it's going to depend on whether those antibodies will crystallize. And, and so with the natural allergen, we come back to that, that, that kind of an issue. Um, just in terms of when the um, um, when we're likely to have allergen uh, hypoallergenic uh, gene, gene edited cats, uh, I think a lot of that is going to depend on um, um, the research that we do over the next year or two um, on the embryological work that uh, Nicole has referred to, but also a, a general issue with CRISPR is how you how do you deliver the gene how do you deliver the gene editing apparatus? Um, and Nicole alluded to viral viral um, 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 vectors and and also liquid uh, lipid nanoparticles. And so we'll just have to those are approaches that we're going to try. I think that's a general problem with CRISPR is how do you, how do you deliver? Uh, it's not the editing necessarily. Um, we've shown that that's, that's, that's very feasible, but the delivery aspect is, is one that will, will, will require um, a lot of attention. Great, thank you, Martin. And I, I think you, know, you addressed one of the other main questions that comes a lot with this is uh, estimated timeline for producing a FALD1 uh, free cat. And, it sounds like 2022 is going to be a pivotal year for the project and looking forward to providing updates in Christmas CRISPR cat webinar volume two. So <laughs> we'll stay tuned for that. Um, well, I think that's about all the time we have for questions here. Um, Nicole, the one burning question I have is where I could get that sweater. I don't know if that's a <laughs> custom sweater just for you. Or if that's... I'll show the cat. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. That's great. Let me pull up um, just uh, some closing slides here, if I may. Um, but again, just want to thank everybody for um, taking time to join us today. I really appreciate that. Um, we'll be sending out a webinar recording to uh, everyone that has registered uh, for the webinar uh, in the coming weeks. Um, but any questions or comments in the meantime, feel free to email, email myself, uh, bsturgill at nbio.com. Uh, and in the meantime, you can view uh, past webinars um, on our YouTube channel. Uh, that includes one on early, uh, or I'm sorry, allergen variability in early introduction foods, uh, one on the molecular approach to allergy diagnostics, uh, one on our environmental testing suite and viral testing capabilities, uh, in our affiliate lab, Indoor, Biotechnolo Indoor Biotechnologies Limited, located in Cardiff, Wales, um, as well as one on our SARS-CoV-2 proteins and simple T-cell test. But with that, we'd just like to close and wish everyone uh, a happy holidays um, from the Indoor Biotechnologies family, both here in Charlottesville, Virginia, as well in Cardiff, Wales. I've enjoyed uh, working with everyone in 2021 
um, and looking forward to a successful 2022 as well. But thanks again for joining. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye.